teaching, the baptism that was taught by that John in the book of Mark, it is not what we may assume it to be. The doctrine, the teaching, the baptism that that John taught is not what we may assume it to be. They taught a baptism of repentance. Yes, repentance is a necessary baptism for the cleansing of the mind. That's, that's basic life. That's basic life. But it's it, it, it just so happens that this John didn't just say basic life, repent and be good and, and move on. He didn't just say that. When it comes to genuine repentance, when it comes to a genuine experience of sorrow, our human experience can uh, allow us to understand that image, vision, envision, reflection, perception is necessary for sorrow to hit where it needs to hit and for change to be where it needs to be. This John didn't just simply utter a saying and then move on to a, a body of water. He, he set before his audience a vision. It is through this vision that his audience is supposed to experience the feeling of repentance, the sensation of needing to repent when observing and when fully taking in this image in order to receive clearness from error. He gave his audience a vision. A vision of what? A vision of a compromised west wind. A vision of a compromised west wind. This John took the west wind, the west wind being the doctrine of that day of Christ, who is Serapis, and placed it amalgamating it into the one that should be the hope that is to come after him. He took these two things, took these two things, the wind of the West and the one that should come after him, put them together and created a narrative around it. A narrative where compromise, that figure is compromised, and the compromising of that figure is what is to lead the one observing that compromise to sorrow. How can we know, though? How can we know that this is what that John taught? How can we know that it is the compromising, it is the compromising, meaning the suffering of the figure that he's highlighting that is to lead to repentance? Don't really have to guess at that. Because he says that in, in that first chapter, he will baptize with water, meaning he himself, but there should come one mightier than him that should then baptize with the Holy Ghost. So we need to ask ourselves, we need to ask ourselves, how is it that that figure is able to baptize with the Holy Ghost? How is it that that figure is able to baptize with the Holy Ghost? Now, there is a known at this time, there is a known belief. And this known belief, the author writing the book of John, confirms to us and unseals to us. So let's go to the book of John, John 7, 38 and 39. John 7, 38 and 39. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. When we're hearing one in the book of Mark, this John, saying that he is baptizing with water currently, but the one after him will baptize with the Holy Ghost, this is a narrative that is unwritten. The unwritten narrative, which is written in John, the unwritten narrative, which the author of the book of Mark knows, but is not saying at all in any one of their chapters within their record, again, but which the author of the book of John conceals and unseals to us, what is known is that the Holy Ghost is supposed to be given after the compromise of the one that should come after that John. The Holy Ghost is not given 
until that individual that should come after John suffers, dies, and is deified. Or suffers, dies, and is glorified. The one that should come after is to unseal to the, to the public the Holy Ghost. And it is through this means of their suffering that this takes place. Yes, the one that should come after, after the one that baptizes with water, he is to baptize with the Holy Ghost. Author of the book of Mark does not allow their John to go into the means whereby that takes place. But they know. We know they know because the author of the book of John knows. <laughs> and the author of the book of John did not get this belief from out of nowhere. This is a belief that is passed down, that is continually re-articulated. That John is preaching a narrative of the one that should come after suffering a compromise in order for that Holy Ghost to be released to his audience. Only when that compromise should occur, only when that figure should suffer, only when Serapis, dressed as that one that should come after that John, suffers and is glorified, suffers and is deified, suffers and is put into place above, beyond, only then will the Holy Ghost be able to baptize that audience. Again, how can we know this? Again, this is a belief of theirs. Going now to the book of Acts. Acts 2, 32 and 33. Acts 2, 32 and 33. This Jesus hath God raised up where we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which you now see and hear. This is in reference to the beginning of Acts 2 and to the occurrence taking place therein. And this is the understanding of the ones going through that occurrence early in chapter 2 of the book of Acts. Highlighting all of this to verify the narrative, the narrative vision that this John taught. This John taught a preaching, a, a belief that the one that should come after him will baptize by the Holy Ghost. Problem is, author of the book of John is not allowing us to understand more of how that's supposed to happen. That's supposed to happen, the author of the book of Mark knows this, that's supposed to happen, despite them not saying so, that's supposed to happen only when the one that should come after that John is deified or glorified. And that's, that's, a, that's interesting because while this, this John is putting out a philosophy of repentance, while this John is putting out a philosophy of remission of sins, it has to be understood that he's putting out, before he can say any of that, a belief on a vision. And this belief on that vision is a vision of one that can only be suffering. Suffering to death for glorification. And we know that it can only be of suffering to death for glorification because that, that John is letting their audience know that he is to baptize them with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost can only shower, bless, however that should, that should do that, when the one that should come after him is glorified, is deified, is set up in position. Verse from the book of John confirms that. Verse from the book of Acts confirms that. This John's doctrine is a doctrine of a suffering demigod. A suffering demigod is what this John taught. And he taught it in the context, not of the West, but he placed it and framed it into a context that 
Jews could be able to gather, and not simply Jews as in by nature, Jews as in Gentiles, Gentile Jews, Jews that were originally not Jews to begin with. These are converts to the Jews' religion. So this John is putting forth a doctrine that is to cover the basis of both the natural Jew and the abnormal Jew, the abnormal Jew being the convert to the Jews' religion. And this baptism that he's talking about, of the one that should come after, it is a baptism that is supposed to take place only when that individual is glorified. This is a belief that is there known already. He's preaching the suffering. He's preaching the suffering, the death, and most likely the resurrection, and then going on past that, the anointing and the glorification and the deification of the one that should come after him. That's the only way, that's the only way that the Holy Ghost could be given to baptize. And it is this vision that, that John is preaching. It is this vision that is to stop his audience, that is to stop their heart, that is to make them drop as if dead, to feel sorrow. The sorrow that's necessary to be felt when observing such an act, and as John places it into context for their sins, that is supposed to allow them to enter into the state of the feeling of repentance to have the clearness that is then necessary to be had. Embark on a voyage through the veils of prophecy with Heaven's Genuine and Counterfeit Ministry. Peer into the shadows of time as this book unveils the Earth Beast's journey. From its enigmatic origins to its astonishing expansion, see how the Earth Beast skillfully weaves a web of false religious ideology. Its aim set on seizing universal religious and political dominion. But that's not the end of the story. Heaven's genuine and counterfeit ministry exposes prophecy's veiled truths, empowering you to discern authenticity from artifice. In addition to learning about the character of the Earth Beast, find out how this book is your companion, being a shield against spiritual manipulation. Unearth the enigma, challenge the illusion, and discover the Earth Beast and its quest for dominance. The decision rests with you. Are you prepared to unravel the truth? Now, when you take all of that into consideration, that really changes the landscape for where we are to believe we should be. Now, we can get the landscape because everything that this author is, is placing about their John in context, it doesn't really suit, it doesn't really suit the age that is assumed this age to be seated in when you really think about it, which leads to the question of what age are we actually in when we step into the book of Mark? What age are we actually in? They tell us the age. The author tells us the age that we are in when entered into the book of Mark in the beginning of their chapter. So let's read that. Mark 1, 1 through 3. Mark 1, 1 through 3. And it reads, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. When is the beginning? This is what we have to pay attention to because they're going to let us know when the beginning of this gospel is. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now, before we touch on the age that we are in when entered into the book of Mark, I think we really have to just look at the verse that is first quoted, because this is a blatant this is a blatant misquote of the actual verse. Now, either the author thinks that the readers are not that, are not all there <laughs> to say nicely, or they're having some fun for a specific reason that only they know. Or it could be a mix of the, of the two, of them both. So let's just read what their interpretation of the verse is. And then let's see the actual verse that, 
that should be here as the quote. So as it is written, this is Mark 1, verse 2. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare, which shall prepare the way before thee. Now that's what they have there written. What does the actual verse say? And I don't think this is really paid attention to because I've never, I've never, I've never heard anyone catch on to the blatant misquote that is going on here. Malachi 3 and verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Now let's, let's look at this. Let's look at this because before I want to get into the next quoted verse, which actually talks about the age in which this, this narrative is, is supposed to be constructed to, to fit in, I want to just talk about how this, this author is not doing this verse any justice. Mark 1 verse 2 says, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Malachi 3 1, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. These are two different verses. These are two very different verses. And, and for some reason, it's not caught on that the author of the book of Mark is supposedly supposed to be quoting this verse from the book of Malachi, but they are completely butchering it to support an agenda that they know. What they are saying, I send my messenger before thy face. I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. It's not the same as I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. These are two different verses, yet the one in the book of Mark, the author is misquoting. Now, they either think their readers aren't going to catch on to it, which it, apparently we have not. But it's really not that difficult to catch on to. Or they think that the agenda that they have in doing so by manipulating this text and from Malachi 3.1 to what they then have it as. It's for something that only they know. Because this is a blatant misquote. And yet, it perfectly relays the agenda that they have in writing the narrative that they do. The language, the language from Mark chapter 1 and verse 2 to Malachi 3 and verse 1, it appears to be saying the same thing. You can't deny that. It appears to be saying the same thing. Structurally, these are two different verses. Mark 1 is appearing to be, Mark 1, Mark chapter 1 and verse 2 is appearing to be the verse from Malachi 3 and verse 1, but it's not. It's a reframing. It's a reframing close in nature, not yet that nature of that verse. It's a reframing to fit a specific agenda. Now, moving forward to verse 3 of Mark chapter 1. The one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. This has a context. This has a context. Going back to the original context in Isaiah 42 through 4. Isaiah 42 through 4 reads, speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her. That her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. She hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight. And the rough places plain. Now the context of this verse, of which the author of the book of Mark takes from the book of Isaiah, is a context that occurs after Jerusalem has suffered double for her sins. When Jerusalem has suffered double for her sins, that's when that verse then should become relevant. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. 
when Jerusalem again has suffered double for her sins. That's when the verse, the saying, prepare ye the way of the Lord, should become relevant. Author of the book of Mark, <laughs> the author of the book of Mark is letting us know by quoting this verse, by them placing this verse in here, into their narrative, the age in which their gospel, their quote-unquote gospel begins. Their quote-unquote gospel begins after Jerusalem has suffered double for her sins. Granted, they're writing in that age. That's the age they're writing in. That's the age they're writing in. So, when, when, when is the first time that Jerusalem suffered for her sins? 2 Kings 24, 10-13. 2 Kings 24, 10-13. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem and the city was besieged. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city and his servants did besiege it. Jehoiachin, the king of Judah, went out, of the, went out to the king of Babylon. He, his mother, his servants, his princes, his officers... And the king of Babylon took him in the eighth year of his reign. He carried out thence all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, as the Lord had said. And it goes on. This is the first time Jerusalem suffered for her sins. When is the second time? The second time Jerusalem suffered for her sins, going to the book of Mark. Mark 13 and verse 14. When you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand. Then let him that be in Judea flee to the mountains. This is the second. This is the second event whereby Jerusalem is suffering for her sins, which is an event highlighted by Daniel 9.26. After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The author of the book of Mark, they are writing about events that have already taken place. It may look like their Jesus in the narrative is prophesying. He is not. He is not. The author of the book of Mark is conveying the art of prophecy to their main character because the events have already taken place. Jerusalem has already suffered double for her sins. That is the beginning of the gospel. And that is the age in which we are entered into when entered into the book of Mark. A genuine relationship with the Bible can be difficult. Sometimes we don't know where to begin. Sometimes we don't know how to trust our experience. Sometimes we may be afraid to get too close to our Creator. Perfecting and reforming personal religion will be your guide. This book will make sure your spiritual journey is fulfilling. Don't miss this opportunity to elevate your devotional practice. Embrace the wisdom within its pages and embark on a journey of self-discovery. Grab your copy now and take the first step towards a more fulfilling and enlightened life. The author of the book of Mark does not hide that much. Once you study again their pattern, their literary pattern, they don't hide that much. They're telling us when these things are in effect. The beginning of the gospel is after Jerusalem has suffered double for her sins. That's why they have that verse there. It's not because of any sort of relevance to their main character, John. It's not because of any sort of relevance in that sense. It's because there is a pattern message. There is a coded and encoded message. The message is, is that the beginning of that record takes place after Jerusalem has suffered double for her sins. Author of the book of Mark understands Jerusalem has suffered double for her sins. 
when we're seeing their main character prophesying about that abomination of desolation that should come, of which 70 AD, that is a reference to, it is appearing as though their main character is a prophet and is prophesying. But the author of the book of Mark already told us when the age began in their first chapter within the first three verses. That's not a prophecy that their main character is giving to us because they're giving us the backdrop of history in the first three verses of their narrative in their opening chapter. We have to catch on to these patterns. We have to catch on to these patterns because the author of the book of Mark is writing not simply just to write. There is a lot that goes into the narrative that they are constructing and they're giving us the answers by writing the way that they're writing about their John, by articulating the speech without articulating the speech of their John, by allowing us to understand the age in which these things are fixed to, from how they are writing, we can know that the age of which is assumed these things to be taking place in, it is not. The author of the book of Mark they are taking history and they're adding it to fiction. They're taking history, both political and religious, and they're adding it to fiction. This is religious fiction, ecclesiastical fiction, and they're taking characters and they are hiding characters by characters. They're taking characters, they're hiding characters by characters, and they're doing so for a specific narrative in dedication to a specific agency. They know what they're doing. They know what they are conveying to the audience for which this is to be conveyed for. Us in 2024 reading this, we can go in all sorts of directions. Because we are just... I don't know. But when you look at the pattern of context that the author is writing with, when you look at what they're actually giving to us in their narrative, when you going episodes back, when we are investigating the garden, because that's the main reason why I wanted to take this trip into the character of John from in the book of Mark to dress and to address the garden for which our devotional conversation is conceived within. When we look at the garden, when we address the garden, which the pair in Eden failed to do, and because they failed to do so, they took the route from which they were originally taken from out of. So let's look at the garden that our in 2024, theoretical belief is framed in. Let's look at that garden and let's see how the author of the book of Mark, looking at one of their characters, zoning in on one of their characters, their character, John. Let's see how they are articulating that character and let's see how the author is articulating the age in which their character exists. Their record begins 70 AD. Their record begins after Jerusalem has suffered double. The history going on in that narrative, the parallelisms going on in that narrative, they are pieced together from political and religious ecclesiastical history and sprinkled on top of that and also grounded within the author's imagination. So when we are seeing these things and lining them up according to how the author is articulating them, it's easy to see that the age in which these things are framed, this is not the assumed age in which theological theory would have its graduates and followers accept. Author of the Book of Mark is telling a story contrary to, tr to traditional theory. 
And when we're going through that garden, when we're looking through the garden of what that is, we are supposed to pick up. We are supposed to pick up a level of understanding that is to advance our primary belief for the intended resurrection, for the intended resurrection to continue the growth and the development of our devotional conversation.